Oh, Open Sousa is on the show again. We looked at Tumbleweed just a little bit ago, but here we have OpenSUSE Leap 15.2. Now it would be unfair of me to make an installer delve joke here because YAS is the real deal. It's a big chonky installer and I would be doing a huge disservice to the distribution if I just skipped it. So here on the desktop we can see, what? I've already talked about the installer in the Tumbleweed episode, you really want me to go through it again? Ugh, fine. The TLDR of it is that Yast is both a powerhouse and a dinosaur, being one of the first GUI-based installers and system management tools. Unlike CentOS, the distribution that it's probably most similar to, it offers many different desktops to install, GNOME and KDE being at the top of the list, but there are other options. If you didn't already know, OpenSUSE uses BTRFS as the default file system, most Linux distros use EXT4, but BTRFS has a really cool snapshotting feature among other things. The very end of the installer is probably the most interesting because it allows you to further tweak your install by selecting the CPU mitigations, basically whether you want them or not, as well as letting you enable or disable the firewall, SSH stuff, and lots of other things. Since I'm running NVIDIA here, it pops up and tells me that the open source drivers suck and I might run into issues. Thanks for the heads up! Okay, now we go back to the desktop, and for some reason OpenSUSE doesn't show a login screen by default. It just like drops you to the desktop. I've always thought that was odd for a workstation distro like this. Fresh install weighs in at 5.1 gigabytes, and here at idle, OpenSUSE with GNOME is using just 750 megabytes. That's got to be one of the lowest on the show for GNOME so far. So yeah, GNOME 3.34. Not the latest or greatest, but it's still good, I think. For comparison, CentOS 8 was using GNOME 3.32.2 in that episode. GNOME Tweaks is installed by default, which is a good choice. You can disable animations here and make it feel nice and snappy the way it does on clear Linux. And I was surprised to see a theme called Greybird Geeko Dark. I thought that Greybird was an XFCE thing, but eh, I don't know, maybe not. There were a few different cursor themes as well as the old GNOME default icon theme. That's pretty cool. And there were a number of extensions pre-installed too, including a Slee Classic theme, which didn't seem to do anything, but maybe I was looking at the wrong place. And in terms of backgrounds, there weren't any. Seriously, there's not even a default GNOME background in here. It's a pity. And since we're already futzing around in the GNOME settings app, let's take a look at Bluetooth. Now to be honest here, I was stunned at how quickly my phone connected and how it just integrated with the system without prompting me for anything besides the connection itself. Like in the panel, it showed an option to tether. I have not seen that before. And dashing over to the printer stuff in GNOME settings, my printer was not only not installed, but it wasn't detected on the network. That's pretty bad, but OpenSUSE has always had trouble with printer stuff for some reason. I don't know why. Hopping over from GNOME settings to YAST, YAST is the tool we saw at the very beginning during the install, and it lets you do... Uh, a lot of things. I covered YAST already in the Tumbleweed episode, but basically it's a super jacked up system management tool. But something I forgot to show in the Tumbleweed episode was the Incurses interface. That's right, the monster that is YAST has a GTK version, a cute version, and a freaking Incurses version, which is like a console version. You could use it in an SSH session or a TTY or whatever. So YAST is the tool that you'd use to manage your software and repos and lots of other things like printers and file sharing and mail servers and uh, kernel settings and everything. That's actually probably the most interesting thing to me about YAST is that you can modify your bootloader and your kernel and just all of this config file level stuff that you would normally have to do in Vim or Nano. You could just do it right here from YAST. It's definitely not everybody's thing, but I dig it. Being that we've installed OpenSUSE GNOME here, there are the obligatory GNOME apps such as GNOME Music, GNOME Videos, and ugh, GNOME Maps. It's back. But look, wait, hold on, it opened. GNOME Maps opened, I just need to connect to my network. Oh, nope, it's gone. You guessed it, it's borked. But since we've got a terminal up, let's go ahead and install and check out NeoFetch. We see the cool little OpenSUSE logo with the kernel version 5.3.18 and 2,240 RPM packages installed. We're using an older version of Bash 4.4 with GNOME version 3.34 with the default themes. So I couldn't use my SD card because there's no EXFAT support and my encrypted internal drive required root to mount. All of my archive files open just fine, including that pesky RAR file, which OpenSUSE now has access to read, but not to create new ones, which is fine. But when I tried to play some audio files, I realized that something was just 
off because, you know, nothing was happening. And when I tried to run it from a terminal, that's when I saw that GNOME Videos is having that stupid driver issue where it can't open it. It's kind of the same issue as GNOME Maps. But this is a good segue to install the NVIDIA drivers, which fixes this issue. So in the past, I would go into Yast, go to the Software Repo section, and enable the third-party repo for NVIDIA drivers, but it's not there. The repo still exists, but you have to enable it through Zipper, which is a real bummer. And even then, once I enabled the repo, there were lots of packaging conflicts. They appeared to be minor issues though, like Zipper was trying to pick the wrong dependencies for the wrong driver version or something. If you've never used Zipper before, this dependency resolution is probably super confusing, and even if you have used Zipper, it's still confusing. Anyway, while we have the NVIDIA driver installing in the background, let's check out how OpenSUSE handles network shares, and the answer is badly. Samba Discovery didn't seem to work at all, and even though I shared the folder through Samba in the context menu, it didn't show up anywhere on my network on any other computer, so that's fun. I couldn't even use SMB to access the stream top, so I guess Samba networking is a no-go here. After installing those NVIDIA drivers in a reboot, we can finally hear some tunes. All of the audio files worked except for the AC3 and WMA file, which prompted me to search GNOME software for a codec pack, which it didn't find. But I did manage to use GNOME software to install Steam, so that's pretty cool. Same sort of story with the video files, only most of them wouldn't play due to the missing codecs. Basically, the only one that actually played was the MPG file, which played really badly, and the WebM file, which was much better. So app images worked great, but flat packs did not for two reasons. For starters, GNOME's file browser thoughtfully tries to open flat ref files in GNOME software, but unfortunately, OpenSUSE's flavor of GNOME software doesn't know what the hell to do with flat packs. So what should we do? Install them from a terminal? Well, that doesn't work either, silly. Well, not right away anyway. See, OpenSUSE has some kind of issue with the way that flat pack is packaged or something. I'm not really sure. But I ran into this problem with Tumbleweed 2. You have to remove a directory to get flat packs to work. It's kind of a nasty bug for a big new release in my opinion. Now before we get into the games, Mango HUD would not run on OpenSUSE at all because of this weird glibc error. It's probably solvable with some sleuthing, but I dug a little bit and I couldn't uncover an easy solution to this. Here's Hotline Miami, which ran just fine, which isn't really that big of an accomplishment. It's kind of a weird game with lots of vapor wavy colors, but it is a native Linux game and it has comically low system requirements. Maybe we'll revisit this game on an episode where we only have access to the open source NVIDIA drivers. Now Left 4 Dead 2 is a somewhat older game that I haven't played in quite a while. It uses basically the same engine as Half-Life 2 and TF2 with a very different aesthetic, obviously. It stuttered a little bit at the beginning, but it evened out pretty quick, and overall, it played just fine. But a game that did not run well was SCP. It's running through Proton, and the entire game felt like I was on some drugs or something, like some seriously heavy tranquilizers, which is actually quite apt since I'm playing a D-boy here. I realized after recording this that the freaking brightness was up all the way. I guess I was too distracted by the drugged up feeling the game gave me since the frame rate was so bad. So OpenSUSE Leap 15.2 feels like an iterative improvement over Leap 15.1, but it doesn't exactly get my tail wagging. The GNOME desktop setup felt surprisingly lightweight and snappy, but I'm a little disappointed that things like Flatpak and printers don't work out of the box. The networking section wasn't great either, like do I need to do something in Yas to set up Samba? Or, like why doesn't this work out of the box? It seems silly. And that actually reminds me, where's the OpenSUSE welcome app? It appeared on Tumbleweed, but not here on Leap? That's strange. I will say that I am impressed with the desktop itself though. I'd love to know what OpenSUSE is doing differently because it wasn't using much in the resource department and it felt great even with the open source NVIDIA drivers. Never mind the apps that didn't work, that's not necessarily the problem of the desktop. But overall, the feel of it, like the snappiness, was comparable to Clear Linux, which was the best up to this point. Probably still is. I will say that OpenSUSE Leap 15.2 is the best release of OpenSUSE yet. It's closer to upstream SUSE Enterprise Linux, and it brings newer software on top of that stable SUSE Enterprise base. But despite being better, it's not really that much better, and several key features still don't work out of the box. So it's definitely worth checking out, but don't expect it to be something that it's not.